All right, welcome to the Parker Office Hour. First time on a Monday, uh, we have changed our schedule. And from now on, we'll have this at 5 p.m. UTC. Um, and yeah, on Mondays, we'll also in the future start scheduling um, calls that happen on 9 a.m. UTC. So these are more for people in in Asia um, and Pacific times zones. So that will be quite nice. Hopefully we can can have a different community uh, join join the other call. Um, so look out for that if you are um, from those areas. And with that out of the way, I think we can get started with some technical things right away. And the first one is actually uh by javier who wants to tell us all about the new parker agent features feel free to take it away hi folks so in the parker agent team we've been working on a couple of uh improvements uh one of them is regarding metadata so one of the first things we do when the agent starts it's to gather metadata on kubernetes and as well of um, some data from um uh Sorry, if I remember system D. So basically we had some problems here because we were um, associating this data using namespaces, but in some instances, this wasn't right. And it was reported by two users, I think, or maybe more. So this is something that Kemal has been working on. And now uh, Frederick took over that work because Kemal is on vacation. So hopefully this is something that will be landing this week. Um, then we are continuing to work on extended language support. So Vaishali continues working on Java. Uh, she's been making uh, some progress on um, Java discovery. So basically figuring out which processes running on your box are Java process. Um, so yeah, that's um, most of it. Uh, then we've also made some progress on uh, Dwarf and Winding, which we want to enable by default in two weeks. The idea is that without having to flip any flags, uh, because right now it's under a feature flag, you'll be able to uh, profile any on every native stack process, uh, any native process on your on your box. Um, so some of the stuff that we've been working under has been improving the reliability of frame pointer based unwinding, which right now we were relying on the kernel helper, which unfortunately doesn't do error handling properly. So whenever the stack was broken, we'll never get an error from it. So in some cases, uh, we'll get broken stacks or completely incomplete stacks. And then once Dwarf Unwinding is turned on by default, these two stacks will never get merged properly because they will be one will be completely wrong and the other one will be complete. So this is something that we're working on. Uh, we've also um, upgraded the uh, LLVM version that we use to compile our BBF code. And even though this sounds like a very low level and no impact for anyone, but Basically, we went from 11 to 14, so a couple of years, and a lot of improvements on um, the compiler. Plus, that we noticed that LVM 11, in some cases, generated code that wasn't accepted by the BBF verifier in certain kernels. So that should be fixed, too. Um, I think that's pretty much like a good summary of the past two weeks. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions or, yeah. How could you take them? So one Go question ahead. I have um, is for the dwarf-based unwinding, does that already integrate with the JIT support recently landed or would that be still separate work? Yeah, I know this is, um, it is related, but it's different in the sense of um, what Dorf uh, based on Wonder deals with is um, only the part of getting the backtrace. And then once we have it, um, there will be like the local symbolization that is done for JIT symbols, right? And then the rest will be sent to Parka uh, to the server to, to do like symbolization on, on the non JIT symbols. So it's kind of related. Um, but no, that, I did. yeah, sorry. How do you get the dwarf information for the jitted code? Yeah, we don't. So this basically only works for ahead of time codes. And um, typically most compilers, like for example, Rust C or Clang or GCC, 
add this in an elf section of the binary. For JIT, um, for JIT to the code, uh, Sumera is working on this. And the plan that we have is that we want to support um, unwinding, obviously, both the JIT bits and the ahead of time bits. So the idea we have is uh, for the ahead of time things, we typically have the unwind information from Dwarf. And whenever we are going through a JIT section, we're going to try with the frame pointers and see what happens. So we either um, might succeed in the end or might fail, and we will never find the um, bottom of the stack. Uh, but that's kind of the idea. So we're going to basically assume that all JITs emit, uh, I mean, compile with frame pointers. I know that this is not true. For example, Java, this is an opt in. In Node, it's enabled by default for what we have seen. But uh, I think you were working with, um, uh, with Julia, right? Yes. So in Julia, I don't know. So maybe you can fill us in. Does Julia always use frame pointers? In, in Julia, we now, uh, as of 1.9, uh, we are turning frame pointers on for the jitted code, which we didn't use to do before, um, mostly for Parker um, and Perf. But the interesting question, I think, and that might need some investigation, is that in theory, the newer JIT dump format also has support for debug information being delivered alongside. So not just simply said, like not just the information or oh, this is this name, but also if I recall it correctly, there is a optional section for debug information. The question is, does LVM actually emit it correctly? Um, because I think it's the only, um, I think there hasn't been a consumer of that information before, but it's supported. So for the dump, yeah, as Javier said, we don't support dwarf unwinding uh, for them. We don't read do those information yet for the gym dump. Uh, Sumeros apparently is working on it. And from what I've seen, the only runtime for now that emits dwarf unwinding in the gym dump is V8. So anything that's based on V8, like um, Node.js and Dino. That's the only ones I've seen to have dwarf unwinding information in the gym dump. So the other ones are all, I think, LVM based, and I suspect LVM might actually just not bother with that right now, but we can teach it. OK. By the way, Valentin, so um, for Julia, if I'm not mistaken, basically what you call JIT is kind of sort of ahead of time, but done out of runtime, right? We, we lovingly call it ahead of time, just in time, yes. OK. OK. Um, cool. Yeah, now, if it has frame pointers, once Sumera implements the um, yeah, frame pointer base and winding for the JIT executables, then I think uh, things should work properly. I'll, I'll probably, once this is ready, we'll probably mention you. Um, so you can take a look and try it on your on your systems and see if it works well for you. But uh, obviously for us, Julia is also important, so we'll make sure that uh, that it works fine. Thank you. All right, nice. That seemed helpful. <laughs> um, right, um, we, can, we can come back to this if there are more questions later. Uh, let's move through the agenda for now. Um, so Thor wants to tell us about experimental error ingestion support in FrostDB and what it means for Parker. Yes. So this is a feature where um, previously, when we'd receive profile writes, we would convert them to a Parquet buffer and then ingest them into FrostDB as a Parquet buffer, which was very memory efficient. Um, but it used a lot of CPU to encode it into the Parquet format. Um, so we've added a new flag called experimental-arrow, um, and this basically changes the ingestion path to convert these profiles into the arrow format and then uh, save those arrow records directly into memory. Um, the nice thing about arrow is it's a no-copy paradigm, um, so when we ingest it, we can shard it off into the database as we need it without having to copy it around. Um, what this means in practice is that you will see a lot less 
uh, CPU usage as we no longer have to do conversions, um, but we will see a slightly larger memory footprint um, due to Arrow not being quite as optimized as Parquet in terms of compression and what have you. Um, that is really the only um, observable result from the end user that we intend. Um, it is marked as experimental, so if there are bugs, if you do choose to run it and you run into bugs or weird behavior, please open up issues. Um, but otherwise, for the users of Parka, it should just be a trade-off of a lot of CPU usage for a little more memory usage. And that's basically it. No questions? Then, again, you, we can ask questions and do Q&A at the end again uh thank you thor i think yes i'm next on the agenda so i actually have something to show let me share my screen uh, all right it should be coming up perfect um so in parka we've merged a quite big feature last week um so and this will pretty drastically change some of the behavior that you're seeing in, in Parker, and we definitely think in a good way. So let me show you what that means. Um, if you go to any of the, uh, in this case, running the Docker, uh, Docker image locally, if you go to any of these um, profiles, you just see the old uh, or known flame graph, not uh, metric graph. Um, as you if you as you know it before uh, from before, um, you can click around. You can you can find the um, profiles just like they are. So nothing really changed here, except when you go to Delta profiles, and these are usually the CPU profiles. Um, so in this case, um, both the process CPU nanoseconds and samples, and this is also true for the CPU samples that the Parker agent collects. Um, once you click on one of these and search for it, it will now um, query the metrics as you know, know it from before, um, at least looking at, uh, supposedly like it. And then we instantly um, query the flame graph um, for the merged, uh, for that time range that, that you selected up here and instantly show it um, to you as, as a user. So there's no more merge button, as you can tell. Also, it's gone from, from the other profile types because it never semantically really made sense there. Um, there's nothing you can you can semantically actually merge. It was really just garbage <laughs> in a way. So that's gone, um, the merge button. And for CPU uh, samples um, and, and the delta profiles is what they are called, um, MPP prof, we instantly merge them. Um, what that also means is the metrics graph um, is now slightly changed. So. I don't know how familiar people are with uh, Prometheus. In Prometheus, there's the concept of step, and that that was also what we kind of like called the feature um, in Parker. Um, so, for every um, for every time range um, that you can select, we say we want to have like a thousand samples in the metrics graph, right? So, if we have a thousand seconds, that means we would have uh, one sample, one metric, uh, like one point in the metrics for each. Um, second, but since we oftentimes have way higher uh, time ranges, we sometimes only have one point, one one metric sample per like minute or per five minutes or per hour, even if we're looking at like weeks of data. So that means that now with like the fifteen minutes uh, time ranges, we roughly get raw results still. Um, however, if we go back to uh, let's say one hour, um, the overall um, samples we get in the metrics graph actually uh, gets gets fewer. And before we still queried the raw samples, so that would mean that once we go to like six hours, we would have like thirty thousand uh, samples that would would have been needed to render on the metrics graph. Whereas now we still get one thousand uh, yeah samples that that will render. Um, and we do some calculation in the background, do some math that <laughs> Frederick and I. Um, yeah, our brains exploded, even though it's like somewhat silly and pretty simple math. It 
it is actually hard to get right. Um, but yeah, overall, we kind of like um, do some some calculations to um, account for the profiling duration and the profiling um, period, and and take that into account, and then get to a a good number for like an interval of five minutes, for example, that we have the um, the data point for. So it's kind of uh, like a rate function in a way, or something like like that in Prometheus, but Parker does that under the hood, so it is the correct um, data that, that gets returned. Again, what it means is that whatever time range you query, we will always return roughly 1,000 data points at most, and this this makes it just efficient to like retrieve it from the back end and also um, then render it on the front end. Um, yeah, you can still click on something here. Exactly, the math is simple, the reasoning is hard. Um, so you can still click on, on one individual timestamp and it will um, query for that timestamp plus the step duration, so plus like maybe one minute or something, and it will only do merged profiles for, for that um, one minute at that point in time. So that is something that changed. So basically everything is a merge profile and um, yeah, at least for the data profiles, but that's more like a implementation detail. Thing is, we don't have the merge button anymore. We can show um, data way more efficient and we always show you the flame graph right away. So that is pretty exciting. Um, and yeah, I think other than that, it still works to, to compare things um, just like before, etc. You can still filter by labels. Um, so all of that is still there. It's just a more efficient way of, of um, kind of rendering the data um, on the front end. Yeah, there are like three or four things we still need to fix under the hood, um, like changes to the API, for example, um, to make it a bit more, um, yeah, natural in, in API terms to, to uh, transfer the data. But once that's done, um, it will be in the next uh, V16 release of Parka. So, yep. Yes, so Maxim, you found the, the main branch is broken and I actually tried to run this from the main branch <laughs> right before this meeting and I failed as well. So something broke in the last four days and I moved back to one image from like four days ago, like one Docker image uh, for four days old that still works. So I think we'll, we'll have a fix tomorrow probably that unblocks the main branch again. I don't think there were many big features shipped in the last four days. So it probably was like something renovate related that broke. So we'll look into that and then main branch should work again. I can, I mean, this is the, <laughs> the commit that, that worked. If that is helpful at all, you can find that on the uh, GitHub Docker registry if you want to check it out yourself. It's not yet deployed on um, the Parker demo either, but that's coming once we like followed up with one or two things as well, and obviously fixed the main branch. All right, there was a lot of talking. Any questions, but also happy to answer them after we are done with the agenda. All right, then let's talk about more UI changes and updates uh, about Parker. I, I just want to yep. give a shout out to, because this has been an effort that we actually wanted to do over a year ago, because we've we've known that this would be a better user experience for a very long time. Um, but we're only now at the point where the storage is fast enough that we're confident in, with to, to enable this um, across the board. So I think like, it's. I, I want to recognize that we we really made a tremendous amount of progress on symbolization, on storage, on storage querying, on rendering the data. Right, like like all of Parka is way 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 better than it was a year ago, and that's only why we were able to do this now. So shout out to everyone who worked on anything related to Parka over the last year. Basically, only because of you, this is possible. Celebrating the deletion of the merge button. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> All right.
Yeah, thank you for recognizing that. It's pretty big. All right. Then Yomi, tell us about more updates yes. on the UI side. Yes, so I can quickly give two updates on the UI side. Um, so one of the things that we did in the past few weeks was to hide the mapping prefix when there is only one mapping on the Packer UI. Um, so just for clarification, um, a mapping prefix currently are those like square, um, the, the binary name in square brackets that we put on the icicle graph spans. Um, so they're usually in front of the function names. So what we did is that we've been working with some users who um, only have a single mapping ever in their profiling data, and it's sort of distracting to see the, the mapping prefix still. So what we did was um, we took care of that by hiding the mapping prefix um, if um, it's just one of them. And also there is a setting on the user preferences model in which you can also signify if you still want to see the mapping or not. Um, I can share the link to the PR in the agenda docu and document, so you can also have a look at that. Um, the second thing that we have done and are currently doing, it's still in progress, is developing a design system for the at Packer components that we currently have in the Packer UI. So um, over the past year, we've been like working on lots of features, we've added plenty of feature sets to the Packer UI. So we decided this quarter to take a step back and fix some of the things that we might have not picked up on or might have ignored. Um, we've been, for example, for the past few weeks, we've been working on adding more ESLint um, presets. We have been fixing some tech tests. We've been removing some unused CSS files um, and converting them to Tailwind. Um, just little, little things like that. Um, but for the design system, what we want to do is sort of maintain a consistency across the components that we use on Parker. So what we did was that we started with an um, RFC to sort of talk about all the things that we want to do and uh, like coming to an agreement on how we want to contribute code, front-end code um, in, in Parker. And once we're done with that, we defined some tasks and we've already started on them. Um, the goal is to have a published and public style guide for the Parker UI where Anyone can see it and see how, for example, a button is supposed to behave on the Packer UI. Um, anyone can contribute to that too. So that's that's what we're trying to do. And we're really excited for that. And we can't wait to share that with, um, with, with everyone. So yeah, pretty much that's the, the update from the, from the front end side. Any questions? It only just occurred to me, maybe, I think we've maybe dabbled with the idea before, but now that we have the patch that removes the mapping prefix and the color coding of icicle graphs, perhaps we should actually just remove it always when the color scheme is enabled, because we already have a thing that distinguishes the frames. Yeah. That is a good suggestion. And if I remember correctly, I think Monica, too, um, who's also a team member on the front end, is also working on a PR to make sure that whenever you refresh the page, the colors for the metrics graphs still remains the same. So I think it's probably a good point to, to, to do that. OK. Yeah. Only, like, only you, just you occurred think... to me because my yeah, was yeah. showing the UI. And then you mentioned that. Yeah, like the the like I'm looking at the from from the previous demo, and you can actually click on the legend for the different mappings there already, and enable like highlighting just the thing for the. Let me, let me share my screen again. <laughs> so, we we kind of we only have one mapping, I guess, which is Parker, but we still have the runtime up here, right? And other binaries would show up in a similar way. So I guess we already have a way to highlight these mappings on, on their own. I guess we can't highlight everything else. But these two, we can, can individually highlight. So yeah, I think it only makes sense what you said, Frederick, that we, we don't need the, the thing anymore. Like, and the thing being 
this, which is apparently still the thing in the in the top table. So that's why I'm able to show the. Yeah, apparently, I think it, there's a possibility that, yeah, it's probably not the latest one or. Yeah, it, it is the yeah. one from like a couple of days yeah. ago because it's yeah. broken in main. But yeah, like I think having yeah, having this. I, I also wanted to point point out that the legend is only visible when you switch to another color scheme. So for the default one, you don't get to have the legend button. But yeah. That is true. Interesting. I'm sure there are ways we can can still have a toggle with a legend up there, even yeah. though there's no color anymore. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You you also met, managed to trigger a bug just now about the highlighting by yeah. <laughs> turning off the. <laughs> All right, quickly stopping sharing my screen then. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, some question. Yeah, that's yeah also I think something that I want to we about are at the end. So I think if there are no more questions about the UI or more like statements from Frederick and I, <laughs> <laughs> then yeah, we can we can totally discuss this. Yeah, do you so, want to reiterate? Yeah, I don't know if you want to or if you, I can as well. Yeah. Um. So I've been. Thinking about uh, so, backstory is that currently Julia is basically doing its own binary delivery system, and so we have a our own build bot system where users upload recipes and we then build the binaries on a server, and then the user can automatically ingest them. Um, combined with that, we prefer when people use our own binaries because. Um, <clears throat> LVM is full of bugs and we fix those bugs, but then uh, those bugs are not fixed on Debian or on Arch Linux. And so in any case, uh, often it is, um, people will use the binaries we have on our system. And so one question I had with regards to that for the longest time is, how do I improve the debug experience um, with those pre-delivered binaries or pre-built binaries? And debug info D over the last couple of years has really taken up um, uh, speed and adoption. So the only question really now is: so how do I start hosting my own? Do all of the right build things so that I split out these binaries? And then um, you folks mentioned that you have been working on uh, a debug info D replacement alternative implementation server. Yes, exactly. So thank you for for setting the the conversation. Um, that's. Yeah, so we we have developed a debug info D API compatible um, server at Polar Signals, um, which essentially instead of and for those who may not be familiar, the like normal upstream debug info D server um, needs to be disk backed, um, and the one that we've built is backed by object storage because that's just much easier for us to manage. Um, on cloud providers. Um, and I've been wanting to open this up to the community for a while anyway. And Julia is by far not the only um, kind of application that this would apply to, right? Like I could imagine that you know we could be a host for um, I can't unfortunately, I can't uh, disclose our customer names, but like insert customer name. Um, who also develops an open source project who would like to host um, debug info D um, data. And so I think I could we, we could talk about, for example, at the very least starting to kind of offer debug info D uh, servers where you can, as a community, upload whatever you want. You would have credentials to it. Um, and then we can add yeah. that to our list of uh, automatically supported servers at Polar Signals. We can add it to Parka, um, or you can just use it in D uh, GBD or whatever you want to use, right? Yeah, there, there's. Um, I think we 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 could also. So the, for me, the question has always been like, do I deploy the disk-based one? Do I re-implement the API um, and hook it into our 
uh, package server infrastructure, right? We we already have this infrastructure for um, for not overwhelming our backend storage systems because as much as GitHub likes to burn money on hosting binaries, um, uh, as soon as you hit them with too much traffic, they get grumpy. Um, uh, and so I could integrate it there, but of course, if I have, if it's more, and it also, of course, right, the, for me, always the question is, right, it's, this is all open source work that we're doing. Um, we have some support through companies and uh, other uh, instruments, but uh, of course, if it's, right, if the implementation, you don't want to open source the implementation, you just want to open up, yeah, it would be a value added contribution for you as Parker. Um, that people start uploading their open source binaries to your server. I mean, <laughs> I also don't want to incur a bandwidth and um, storage bill for you that is uh, outside what is uh, acceptable. I mean, um, it doesn't really matter where, right? Like, if this is a valuable thing for the Julia community or whoever, like, and someone wants to offer this, um, like the cost needs to be paid from somewhere, of course, anyway, like that would even be this, the, the case for, for us. But like, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like the, the downloads for um, debug infos is probably going to be significantly less often than for Julia itself, for example. Um, let, let par that Parka that's only, that's sorry. Yeah. That's the hope, right? The debug info should be very rare or in, in, in contrast to like frequency. Agreed. So um, I have no issue with open sourcing our, our implementation. It's it's very small, right? Like it, <laughs> right. it's <laughs> it's 50 lines of code or something. Like I have no issue with that. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, we we can I think I think we can we can we can talk about that. Um, I think it's really much more about how do we give authenticated access to whoever needs to upload the um, debug infos, and that we already have in the Parka um, project, right? We have the um, functionality that says, "Do you already have this debug info?" And debug info D doesn't actually have an API for this, right? You need to actually dump it onto the disk somehow. Right. Um, this is what always reading the docs. I was like, so how are you actually doing the like ingestation? Oh, you just okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I would suggest we we have an API for this, right? Like we would re reuse the already existing open Parka API. Um the only part that um probably wouldn't be open source, and I don't think that would even make sense, is kind of the API authentication layer that we have in Core cool. Signals. Um but that's not really because we don't want to open source it. It's just, you know, a part of our mono repo. It's just practicality. So basically, I would run the, uh, I would get the Parker agent onto my build bots, and then say at the end, um, upload the debug information for this binary. We actually have a CLI already. Let me. Yeah. Um... Have this CLI creatively called Parka debug info. <laughs> um, this is essentially what you just mentioned. It just doesn't ship all of Parka agent. Um, it's just the bits that extract debug infos from um, from a binary and uploads them through the Parka APIs. Great. I think the piece that we would need to figure out still is um, one, we would need to get you access to um, polar signals. Um, okay. And then how do we create a domain or how do we um, point a, whatever DNS host you want um, at this? But I think that's something that we can discuss outside of this meeting. Sounds great, yes. But yeah, I think this is something that, that we've been wanting to do for various open source communities. So. I'm glad you kicked off the, the conversation. Wonderful. Awesome.
Anything else Q and A related? Hey, uh, I'm a kid. Hey, yeah, go Can ahead. You hear me? Yeah. Uh, I had a, I was uh, I learned uh, I'm I was learning basics of Go, so I was looking out the project to contribute. So while searching around that, I got the this Parker Parker or Dev uh, project. So uh, I was looking uh, out uh, for an overview. What is it? Uh, for uh, for my analogy, I thought it is like task manager in my Windows for uh, for a big projects that we see. But what is it exactly? Can you tell me? And how can I uh, make make uh, it is a beginner friendly thing that I can do? All right. Um, yeah, I mean, glad you found Parker. Um, that's really cool. Um, I'm not too sure how beginner friendly it is, but I can kind of quickly give you um, a very basic rundown. So. Um, Imagine like all the programs, all the processes running on, on your host, on your computer. And um, while they're executing, they're actually um, like reading and writing um, stack stack frames um, uh, in, the, in the machine, right? So we're executing functions and then um, functions call each other and then um, they return. So we kind of walk the, the stack back up again. Um, and, and that's something the, the computer does all the time. And what Parker allows you to do is to, over time, see um, what the computer is doing on a per process basis so that in the end, you actually have a better understanding on which, which function is calling which other function. Um, and, and you can kind of, as a developer, so in, in that sense, it's not purely a task manager where you can see what is running just on, on a high level. Um, glance that something is is running and maybe taking up so many CPU, but it's it's going a lot deeper for developers writing the software, so that you can actually troubleshoot why something is kind of slow, taking um, too much CPU, or um, why is it so expensive to run? Things like that. That's that's pretty much what what Parker is doing. Um, yeah, I don't know if if there's anything more specific you want to hear. Oh, I got it. But uh, uh, how this ha helps us? The, how uh, they they say uh, how do Parker we can get uh, uh, we can understand it how things work. But, uh, how can we can benefit out of it? What is the right? Uh, so so overall, the problem is that um, the they they are like and and this is mostly targeted at. Um, developers running systems across many servers. So it's not really, I mean, you can run this on a single process, on a, uh, on a single machine, but we are mostly focused on cloud computing infrastructure, right? Where people have like, like 10 plus servers, like up to hundreds of servers, even thousands. So it's really hard and rough to say what is like, what, what everybody's spending CPU on. So like with, with this, Parker is kind of collecting all the data or this data is being sent to Parker. And then you can say, okay, please, please show me um, where the CPU is spent in, yeah. in, in these processes, right? So this is where you can see like down to line numbers, down to like functions calling each other where the time is spent. Um, so everything that's like wider um, in, in this graph, there's more time spent. So we are spending more time uh, in this write raw function compared to um, over here, like something compact loop called, for example. And that's very specific to the person writing or like the team writing the software. So they know what to to kind of make from all of this information, but it at least gives the team the information to kind of yeah act on it and maybe improve this thing if there's something that needs to be improved. Okay, I got it. I somewhat think something that we can uh, figure out uh, which is taking in uh, uh, more memory or low memory and we can manage it out with optimizer code while yeah exactly okay. yeah like I mean this was CPU but there's also like as you said um, like where where are we spending um, the the memory right so now we see where 
Um, like this thing, for example, grow slice, it's just an array in memory, basically. So something something is like copying arrays over here. So that would be something me writing Parker, I would look at if that's something I need to troubleshoot. Yeah. OK, thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. And yeah, glad you found Parker. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I can contribute in it, but uh, it is uh, the, how much Vigna friendly you can. Uh, should I go to documentation first and uh, no code things or? Yeah, I think that that makes sense. You can you can read through lots of the documentation we have, and then um, we are actually an open source project on GitHub. And yeah. we have the issues tab over here. And I'm pretty sure we have the uh, good first issue um, label. So there are different ways of contributing. So Parker itself, um, like the server, like the backend is written in Go, but we also have like the UI written in, in, in React TypeScript. So there are different ways of contributing. We have a CI where people can contribute. We have like um, again, documentation, like if you read through the documentation, something isn't clear, you can tell us um, we need to improve in, in that area, all sorts of things. But like this, like good first issue label is, is hopefully a good starting point as well. OK, thank you. Sure thing. All right, anything else? Something uh, occurred to me just now. Um, we were talking about uh, JIT dump earlier and Node.js. I feel like, and this may I just may just be completely misremembering. Um, I think Maxime, Maxime, you said that unwind information tends to be um, in the JIT dump for Node.js or Dino. Um, I I thought that they'd use frame pointers. Am I completely mistaken? They do use frame pointers, yeah. Unwinding is working uh, in, in the demos. So, but they also include dwarf unwinding in their JIT DOM. Fascinating. Okay, cool. Just, I, I guess, I guess you can still produce dwarf unwind information. I guess nothing speaks against that. But um, okay, cool. Thanks for for reconfirming that. Yeah, in the demos, we have the things I've seen that doesn't work with uh, JIT DOM or PathMap was PHP doesn't compile with frame pointers. Python, the most build don't compile with frame pointers. And there was uh, Julia, but Julia is going to be fixed in the next release. Next releases, I think. After yeah, cool. .NET was working, I don't know if it's enabled frame pointers when you enable the JDump, or it's always enabled. They do tell there's like 10, 20% overhead when you enable path map. I don't know if it's actual. Julia, by the way, had a benchmark when they did the change to enable Fine pointer, you did 5% CPU time and 1% of memory from the, the benchmark. So it's very, fairly low, I think, um, worth it. Where are these? Uh, 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 do, you could, want you, could you drop a link? Um, yeah, this, totally. maybe on Discord. It's in the PR, I think. Uh, you share the PR, I'll find it again. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for elaborating all that. Okay. Any anything else? Um, otherwise, uh, I think the next one is in two weeks, and we are going to the next Parker office hours. Um, and. We are also going to schedule the 9 a.m. UTC um, Parker office hours that are more friendly for, for Asia Pacific. So look out for those, because I'm pretty sure it's quite late. Yeah, it's like past 11 in India now. So that should be a lot more, um, a lot nicer for folks there. Yeah, so I think if nothing else, that is it. And we see each other in two weeks. Maybe we'll have a Parker release in between. Maybe not. But I think we have a, make it happen. We have enough to to make an make a final uh, another release soon. Yeah. All right. Then see you in two weeks, everybody. Thank you for attending. 
and have a great local time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.